pray it's a blessing to, to everybody here. I would love to. I would love to see you grow a little bit, take off a little bit. Whatever the Lord wants to do with it, I think, I think we, we need it. We, we need a, a refocus. But, um, yeah, I think it's going to be. Hopefully, everybody. You're almost All right, as you make your way back in here. There will be more time to check out all the tables after this last session. I'm not going to kick you right out of here. So, uh, very quickly before we uh, start the, the worship, I want to just uh, mention a little bit about who we are. Uh, how many of you have seen us sing before? Okay, well, that's almost everybody. Uh, for those of you who uh, are not familiar with us, um, my name is Bill Itzel, and I'm uh, my wife Karen, and many of you know her story, and uh, this is actually her first weekend to be singing with us for the whole concert, so this is kind of exciting uh, to have her here after being uh, 17 days on a, on a ventilator, so with the, with the COVID early in the year, so. Uh, daughter Shannon is here, daughter uh, Siri is here as well. And uh, we are we're thrilled to, to be a part of this. We, we love attending conferences. First one we ever attended, I think, was uh, Strange Fire. We got a little, got a little whiskey. Hey, you were there. Wow. Uh, <laughs> wow. We didn't, uh, I didn't, I didn't uh, see Mark Crystal uh, peddling his books out of the, uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> didn't see that. But it was a great con uh, conference. And we've been going to a whole bunch uh, ever since uh, T4G, Spazner Summit. Uh, they went to the Lake Mirror one year. The last year that uh, RC was there. Oh, so, wow. Um, in fact, we, we almost heard him preach. Really? We, uh, we had the first, uh, the first one, uh, he was there for a QA, and then the last day he was supposed to be the closing preacher. Wow. And uh, he, his health kind of failed there at the end, and uh, they, so they just kind of ended it. But, wow. uh, but yeah, we, we have been so blessed, and we've learned so much, and it is so thrilling to have a something like this that's close by with uh, the preachers who are preaching the word and know that there are so many uh, who are, are standing in the pulpit preaching the word. That's, that's, it, it's an encouragement to me after 30 years of ministry. Um, uh, our ministry, of course, we have a table out there. Make sure to check out the, the stuff. Take some music home with you. We do have some new, uh, uh, some new music as well, I think, since we were here last time. Uh, if you haven't signed up for our newsletter, make sure to do that. And if you know of any churches, we are trying to fill our calendar in. Things got a little slow in 2020. <laughs> and uh, but now that things are opening back up, we're, uh, we're uh, uh, praying for us that we can uh, get back to doing what God's called us to do. In the meantime, uh, I am, uh, we have made the decision to spend our weeks uh, preaching out on the street with Ryan. And uh, so we're, we're going to be out there doing that as well, doing work with the angels. And uh, so that's, uh, that's a blessing. So, uh, will you stand with us as we, as we sing, giving thanks to the Lord, our God. 
wrote that song, the first song that we sang? Is that is that right? That's, that's a wonderful song. I, 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 that was really, I, I love that. Uh, as Bill mentioned, Ryan uh, and I, and Bill actually, we met at a Ligonier conference in Washington, D.C. Well, actually, it was an expositor's preaching conference. Uh, uh, Stephen J. Lawson was, was preaching and teaching there on expository ministry. And uh, Bill was seated about two rows in front of me. And uh, I think it might have been the front row or the second row back. I can't remember. But all I remember is this, this crunching sound from a cookie bag. And uh, <laughs> and I hear this, you know, what a, you know the cook, the the chip bag making the crinkly sound. And uh, I think it was Bill was munching on some cookies. And Stephen Lawson said, "Are you going to finish that I got <laughs> in, front of, in front of the whole conference?" I got so much fun. <laughs> it, it was it was a good time. So that's how we met. And uh, <laughs> no, but I, I've been able to. Uh, by God's grace, I've been able to be in touch with the Itzel family on and off through their social media platforms and their ministry, and uh, now, v now Ryan through email and as well as social media. And uh, we've actually been corresponding for uh, since before 2020, we're trying to get you here to preach. And um, I'm just really thankful, brother, that you're able to come here and preach the word of God uh, to us. So if you now would come, brother. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is a joy and a privilege for me to get to be here with you all. Um, just to get to stand here in this pulpit after having heard the word preached faithfully by my two brothers in Christ, it is just honestly a privilege for me to stand here as well. Um, as uh, Pastor Deacon just shared, my name is Brian Itzel. I'm uh, an evangelist with Open Air Campaigners. And so most of my time preaching is actually spent out on the streets with an audience that can be a little bit more antagonistic. So it is a blessing to get to be with brothers and sisters in Christ who uh, love the Word of God and love to hear the Word of God preached. Um, I'm excited to be here. When Pastor Deacon, as we've been messaging back and forth over the last few months, uh, when he shared with me about what was going on here at the conference, I was excited because, you know, with COVID, everything that's been going on, uh, so much has been shut down. But just for a local church to come together with local pastors, uh, an evangelist to preach the word of Christ and to be encouraged by it and, and called to follow what the word of God says. What an encouragement to be a part of that. So he shared with me and asked me to preach on the topic of the word and evangelism. And uh, I was overjoyed when he shared that with me because for me as, as an evangelist, I really believe, and I'm, I'm seeing this more and more as people go out to proclaim the gospel or pro proclaim versions of the gospel, a deviation from the word in evangelism. Uh, in the, on the streets in Ocean City, just a couple years ago, we were with a group of, of teenagers teaching them how to share the gospel on the streets. And, and we were, uh, it was probably three, three or four nights into our week of doing evangelism there. And there were prosperity preachers who came out to call people to have this, you know, just proclaim that they would be rich, that their bank account would be full, and all, their, all of the things that they needed would just be supplied right then and there. And to me, it just was, this was even before I had come back on staff with the Open Air Campaigners, it was just so clear that the world and even people who are claiming to be Christians and followers of Jesus Christ are deviating from the word. Uh, so the centrality of the word in evangelism has been lost greatly um, in modern evangelicalism. And so today, I want to share with you all from the word of God. I want to share with you all from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You can turn there now. But there are things that I want us to, that I pray, hope and pray, we will walk away from as we spend time in this passage. My desire, my, my prayer is that as we spend time, we will grow to, more to know what God has said. It is so important for us to know what God has actually said in his word. We will not be able to obey him. We will not be able to follow him faithfully if we don't know what his word says. And so I pray that we will walk away from our time in this passage knowing what God has said, but also that we will grow in our faith, believing what God has said. Not just that we would have a head knowledge of what the Word of God says, but that we believe and we would trust that what the Word of God says 
is true. And I also pray that in our time, it will, it will result, the outflow of our time in this passage will be that we will obey what God has said, that we will submit to what the Word of God has said for us, especially pertaining to this idea of evangelizing the lost, whether that be on the streets, whether that be in our workplaces, or even in our families, sharing the gospel with those that God has brought our way. So for the sake of time, I want to get right into our passage, but first, if you would, bow with me in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this opportunity to be here and to proclaim the word of Christ. Lord, I thank you for Pastor Deacon bringing this conference together and this desire to call us back to the Bible. When the world is calling us to everything but your word, Lord, praise your name for an opportunity for brothers and sisters in Christ to gather and be devoted to what your word says, to be back to the Bible and obey it. Lord, I pray uh, that you would give me the words to speak. I pray for us here that we would hear what you have to say, not what I have to say, and that you would be honored, that you would be glorified, that you would be magnified, and that as we walk out from here, that we would be faithful proclaimers of the true gospel, not compromising, but faithful, faithfully proclaiming the truth of your word. Lord, we pray all this to the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. So like I said, if you would turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to focus our time in actually verses 17 and 18. But in order for us to really understand what Paul is talking about, in order for us to rightly understand these words and how they can apply to us, we need to understand the context in which Paul was writing. We need to understand what he was saying and to whom he was saying it to. So there are a couple pieces of context that I want to point out to us. First, this book obviously was written by the Apostle Paul. It begins by saying, Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, right? So Paul has been called. He is the one writing this book. And what does it say in verse 2? Whom, to whom he is writing? To the church of God, which is at Corinth. So Paul is writing, and he's writing to a church. He's writing to a group of believers that are dear to his heart. We know from Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 17, that Paul was the one that God used him and used his preaching to establish the church of Corinth. So for Paul, these people are dear to his heart. His desire for them was that they would grow, that they would mature in their faith, and that they would glorify God in both word and deed. Colossians chapter 1, verses 28 to 29, kind of sum up Paul's desire for the church. Not just for the church of Colossae, not just for the church of Corinth, but even for all the churches in which he ministered, and I believe what his desire would be for us today. First, or Colossians chapter 1, verses 28 to 29 say, We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. This was Paul's ministry philosophy. This is what his desire was for the church, was that we would be complete in Christ. So as we come to the word, we need to understand that Paul is writing to this church, and that's his desire for them, that they would be complete in, in Christ. But Paul is also writing to a church. He's writing to a group that, was, that didn't have it all together. It was a group of struggling believers. The church of Corinth had come out of deep and wicked pagan idolatry. In this letter, Paul answers questions that the Corinthian people had because they were struggling with things both doctrinally and practically. He patiently teaches them as you work through the book of 1 Corinthians, patiently teaches them the foundational truths of the gospel 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we see that as he says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised from the dead in accordance with the scriptures. But he also rebu rebuked and corrected the immoral practices that had infiltrated the church. We see that throughout the entire chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So Paul wrote to a group of struggling believers. And then finally, as we're going to see in sort of the immediate context of our passage, as we're going to read some of the verses uh, that came before verses 17 and 18, that Paul begins this letter by addressing prideful divisions that had infiltrated the church and were promoted under the banner of baptism. So if you would, 
Let us begin at verse 10, and we'll read verses 10 through 18. Hear the word of the Lord. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. Now I did baptize also the household of Stephanos. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This afternoon, what I want to do is give you three words to help guide our time in this passage, to help outline what Paul is talking about, specifically in verses 17 and 18, to help us understand Paul's view of the Word, of the Word of God, and specifically how this applies to our evangelism. So the three words. First is the centrality. We're going to see in verses, or verse 17, the first half, we're going to see the centrality of the word preached. Second, we're going to see clarity, the word clarity in the rest of verse 17, the clarity of the word preached. And then finally, in verse 18, we're going to see the conviction of the word preached, conviction. So we begin our passage by looking at how Paul viewed the preaching of the word as central to the work of the ministry. The Corinthians had become distracted from the point of baptism by prideful boasting. They were boasting more about who baptized them rather than boasting of the one who saved them from their sins, who died that they might have eternal life. See, baptism is an outward proclamation that you have died with Christ, that you were buried with Christ, and that you were raised with Christ, an outward proclamation of an inward reality. This is why Paul reminds them back in verse 13, if you'll look back in verse 13, that it was Christ who died for them, not the one who baptized them. Verse 13 says, has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Paul's words here must have shocked the Corinthian church in light of their distraction with factions. These people were caught up with divisions, viewing themselves as superior to one another based on who baptized them. Now, this is not something that is unique to Paul's time, but this is something that we as a church often struggle with ourselves. I spent uh, three years serving as the student ministry leader of a church nearby, and when you're working with students, they may not use the word divisions or they may not use the word factions, but there were definitely the modern term cliques going on in the youth group. You could see it them separating. The public schoolers had their section, then there was the homeschoolers, and then there were the ones who were connected to the Christian school that was uh, connected to the church. And they all thought themselves in some way, shape, or form to be better than the other based on what school they were going to, except for the homeschoolers who were just kind of having a good time. <laughs> I can say that because I was a homeschooler. Um, <laughs> this was an issue during Paul's day, but this is still an issue today. And the reason is because the pride that caused it during Paul's day has not left the heart of man. Now, you can just imagine some of the things that the people during Paul's time were saying. They might have said something like, Peter, you know, he, he's coming to town. Hey, did you hear he's coming? We might, you know, if you want to join our group, now's the time. You can ask him to baptize you and you can be part of our special group. And then others might have said, no, 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 I'm not joining him. I want Paul to baptize me. He baptizes very few people. So I want to be part of that group, right? And you can just imagine the types of things that people would have said during the time 
But the problem was they had lost sight of the centrality of Scripture. The Word of God had become a distant light and a universe of legalistic boasting. Paul's words must have shocked them when they read verses 14 and verse 17. Those verses again say, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. In verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach. Paul told them he thanked God that he did not baptize them. Not only this, he he said that Christ himself did not send him to baptize, but to preach the gospel. For people who were caught up and who was baptizing whom, Paul just shattered the mirror of their pride and vanity. Christ did not send me to baptize. Instead, Paul was given a greater purpose. Now, it should be understood that Paul is not saying that we shouldn't baptize. He's not rejecting the ordinance of baptism. Clearly, that's not the case, because in this passage, Paul actually tells of a few people whom he did baptize, Crispus, Gaius, and the household of Stephanos. But Paul's ministry was not a baptizing ministry. It was a word-centered ministry, right? While Christ did not send him to baptize, he sent him to preach the gospel. And Paul understood that a biblical evangelistic ministry is a gospel preaching ministry. Paul understood that a biblical evangelistic ministry cannot be full of distraction by worldly pride. This is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, which encouraged me greatly, Pastor Deacon sent this to us right before uh, we came here just a couple days ago. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. This was Paul's idea of ministry, a scripture-centered ministry. John MacArthur commenting on Paul's words in verse 17 said this, His calling was to preach the gospel and bring men to oneness in Christ, not in baptizing, to create a faction around himself. As we each have the right priority in our lives, we too will be determined to serve the Lord in truth and unity, not living in the carnality and confusion of dissensions and divisions. A biblical evangelistic ministry is a word-centered ministry. Now, we've seen, the, uh, we've seen the centrality of the word preached, that we need to keep that as the focus of our ministry, as we're bringing the gospel to our loved ones, as we're bringing the gospel in our workplace to those on the streets. The word must be the thing that is preached. Paul preached the gospel. But our passage continues now with Paul's view of the word, that it should be preached with clarity as we evangelize the lost. Verse 17 tells of Paul's commitment to the simple message of the gospel. It says this again in verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. Paul was not willing to change the message or even use worldly methods in an attempt to bring people to Christ. Paul preached the word with clarity. The world world in which we live is full of churches, ministries, and preachers who will try to win people in every other way than using the Word of God. They'll try to see, or they'll seek to reason people to Christ with their own ingenuity, as if their thoughts were greater than God's thoughts. Often they seek to draw people in with a watered-down message separating everything that is what we would call, and even the passage is going to call, foolish, But anything that the world would reject or see as not tickling to their ears, they would seek to reject that and water it down to a message that pleases their carnal desires. Or, finally, they will try to entice people with worldly pleasures. We see that with the prosperity gospel movement as they're calling people to come to Christ so that they can have all of their desires realized. That they'll be healthy and that they'll be wealthy. They'll have everything that they want. Pragmatism has caused many churches and ministries to become fruitless when it comes to eternal impact. It seems that we have truly reached, in many ways, the time that Paul spoke about in 2 Timothy chapter 4, as we just heard preached. Verses 3-4 through four again just says this, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with, 
to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. While so much of the the modern evangelical church in America and even around the world has pursued this direction, Paul was not willing to compromise the integrity of the gospel message that he preached. He conveyed, in fact, this commitment to preaching the word with clarity multiple times to the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 3 through 4 says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of man, but on the power of God. 2 Corinthians Chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, likewise says this, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we received mercy, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. The preacher of the gospel must be committed to preach the word with clarity And to preach the word with simplicity, rejecting any worldly methodology. We don't need more. This is what we need. The question, really, though, that some might ask when they come to this point, they might say, why? Why did Paul have such a commitment to this? Why was he not willing to compromise? Why was he not willing to change? Well, it's in the verse. Look again at verse 17. It says, That he was called to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. Paul understood that all human ingenuity, all worldly methodology ultimately is vain. While you might see full churches or, or groups that call themselves a church, ultimately it will never produce lasting fruit. It's once been said, what you win them with is what you win them to. Now that phrase, obviously, we have to understand that in light of the sovereignty of God, right? Who saves according to his will, he effectually saves his own. But as we go out, we preach the gospel, this is true. If you preach a message and people begin to follow you that's void of the scriptures, then you've won them to something other than the God of the scriptures, But if you preach the word, if you preach the word with clarity as God has said it, not being distracted by other things, not being fueled by your own pride and your own so-called wisdom, then the people who respond in faith have been saved to the true salvation that is only found in Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul preached what God said, the way God said it, because of the truth of Romans Chapter 10, verse 17, that tells us, So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, I think said it so well. He said, No real faith was ever wrought in man by his own thoughts and imaginations. He must receive the gospel as a revelation from God, or he cannot receive it at all. God has ordained that it be by the preaching of his word that that mankind would be brought to saving faith. And thus, we must preach his word in clarity. So we've seen the centrality of the word preached. That the word must be the thing that we preach. It must be the message. That we are simply the messengers to bring this truth to a lost and dying world who need to hear it. We've also heard... Paul's commitment to the clarity of the word preached, that we would not twist it, that we would not adjust it, but that we would preach the word as it is. And now finally, in verse 18, we will turn to the conviction of the word preached. Verse 18 says this, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. As Paul had just told the Corinthian church of the simplistic gospel message that he preached, He now turns to show the two responses that people often have or will have. It's only going to be one of these two responses that people have to the message that we preach. First, often the world will respond, most of the time, the world will respond to the word preached and call it foolishness. 
When the gospel message is preached, the world will view it as foolishness. In a day and age in which we live in America, and even, but even in a, around the world, in a day and age where either be, people believe that science is the path to knowledge and truth, or that there is no path, that there's no way that you can know anything, there's no such thing as absolute truth, a message that says that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved from your sins, is seen as foolishness. Man's wisdom will never produce the righteousness of God, obedience to God, submission to the word of God. And the reason that the message is foolishness is because of what Psalm verse 14, 1 tells us. That the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. Here is no one who does good. At the very core of all disbelief, whether it was the disbelief of those that were preaching the gospel now, or even our own disbelief before God sovereignly and graciously saved us from our sins, at the core of all disbelief is the unrighteous suppression of the truth that comes from our sinful nature. What did he say in Psalm chapter 14, verse 1 again? He says, they are corrupt. That is who we are when we are outside Christ. And verse or Romans 1, 18 again tells us that mankind has suppressed the truth with unrighteousness. The message is foolishness to those who are perishing. But praise the Lord that that is not where verse 18 ends. He says, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. While those who are perishing view the message of the cross as foolishness, those who are being saved see it rightly, that it is ultimately the thing that saved them. It is the avenue by which God used to bring us to saving faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3-6 through six say this, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Let light or light shall shine out of the darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. The message of the gospel brings sight to the blind and it brings life to those who were once dead. When God shines the truth of the gospel into the hearts of his elect by the preaching of the word, he will sovereignly save as completely and as effectively as when he said in Genesis 1-3, let there be light. It is the foolish message that we preach that God uses to call his sheep unto himself. Now you might be wondering at this point, what does this have to do with the conviction of the preaching of the word of God? Well, let me tell you. If we do not have the same biblical conviction, the same guardrails that Paul had in his ministry... That the word of God is powerful to save, then we will be hopeless to remain faithful when the world calls us foolish. When the world mocks you, when the world spits in your face, when the world says that you're stupid because you believe what this book says, it is tempting and easy to feel that draw to compromise. To either stop proclaiming the message or to compromise the message and water it down, turning it into something that is less than what it really is. But Paul saw it rightly. He had the conviction that when he preached the word, when he preached and the world called it foolish, that he knew that God was powerful to save through his word. And he would not compromise. This is the whole basis of the seeker-sensitive movement that we see in our world. It's that they remove anything offensive, remove anything that's foolish, so to speak, from the message and replace it with whatever carnal men want to hear. Now, this conviction must be kept if we're to be guarded from going off the rails, if we're to be guarded from turning our way from a biblical ministry to a man-centered ministry. Now, J.C. Ryle said it so well, speaking specifically of doctrinal distinctives, but it applies directly to what, we, what we're talking about here today. 
And he said this, Never, never be afraid to hold decided doctrinal opinions, and let no fear of man and no morbid dread of being thought party-spirited, narrow, or controversial make you rest contented with a bloodless, boneless, tasteless, colorless, lukewarm, undogmatic Christianity. Let it not be said of us that we compromised in the message of the gospel for the favor of man. As we seek to save or seek to proclaim the gospel that God might save the lost, let us not compromise and preach our own thoughts. Your family members, the people, your co-workers, the people that you see if you go out on the streets to share the gospel as we should be doing, they need this. They don't need what we have to say. They don't need our thoughts. They need the word of God preached. And God has said that he will bless the preaching of his word. So as we come to a close on this, at the beginning, I shared with you my desire for us as we walk through this passage, that we would know what God said, that we would believe what God said, and that we would obey what God said. And so I ask you now, if you would, as, as I need to do, as I'm preaching this same message to myself right now, that we would humble ourselves to know what God said, that we are called to preach the word in our evangelism. As we seek to bring the gospel to the lost, we're called to preach the word, not our own thoughts. Oh, how easy it is to turn back to my own wisdom, but to keep ourselves in the lane by the guardrail of this conviction. That we would know what God said, that we would believe what God said, that the salvation of the lost will only be accomplished by the preaching of the word. That it's his word that is going to do it. God has promised that to be so. And that we would obey what God said, that we would be faithful to the end to preach the word when the world calls us foolish because they will and they will do worse. We're so blessed in this country to have not received the level of persecution, but in a way we look forward to it knowing that God is going to purify us and grow us to be more faithful to him when the world mocks, when the world persecutes. So may we be faithful now so that when that persecution comes, we will be faithful to him then, knowing that God will accomplish the work through the message preached. In conclusion, I want to read a verse from Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, that I think encapsulates what Paul is saying here and what really this conference is about. So Isaiah 55, verse 11 says this, So will my word be, which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. Let us be faithful messengers of the king. We're, we're proclaiming the message of the king of kings. Let's be faithful messengers of the king and proclaim his word to the lost. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this time that you've given us. Thank you for your grace and your mercy to me. Lord, I pray that somehow something that I said as, as a preach your truth, Lord, we praise your name that your, your word is powerful even when the speaker is not, Lord. And we praise your name that when we are weak, then you are strong. So, Lord, we pray that from our time today that we would be faithful to you, that we would be energized to be back to the Bible and to stay with the Bible, that we would be faithful proclaimers of your word to the lost. Lord, help us till the end to be faithful men and women for you and your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Would you please join me in thanking these men for giving their time and bringing the word to us today. Thank you. There's a little book down there on the bookstore shelves. Uh, it's a children's book. It has a picture of George Whitfield on the front. And for those of you that don't know who George Whitfield is, uh, he has probably contributed to being almost single-handedly, aside from the Wesley brothers, the spark that ignited the Great Awakening uh, in the 17th century, in the 18th century. And uh, he wrote in his journal one day, uh, he said, I was privileged to have dung, glass bottles, and a dead cat thrown at me while I was preaching today. And he said that he considered that a privilege. Uh, may we consider such things a privilege because dear ones, right now, as I think it was Ryan who said, um, 
the persecution that is taking place in Canada right now with isolating different churches and church congregations and local churches from being able to worship, it's a real thing. It's happening. And uh, there are several churches that have been forced underground to worship. Um, so we need to be praying for our dear brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who are worshiping the King of Kings through the preaching and teaching of this word. I pray that you have been blessed today by the hearing of this truth and the singing of the gospel. And I pray that from here, it wouldn't stop when you go out those doors. I pray that you would carry this with you and that you would be bold to stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because there is no other name given among men under heaven by which we should be saved than the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. So thank you again. And uh, Lord willing, we will be able to do this again sometime. So if you don't mind, close in a word of prayer with me as we get ready to dismiss. Father, again, we praise your holy name. We thank you that you have given to us this, this overwhelming treasure that is your word. To even contemplate a life without your truth is unfathomable. I thank you for the men and women who have ministered to us here today. I pray that you would continue to bless them as they serve you, embolden them, encourage them, strengthen them, equip them to proclaim your gospel to a lost world. Would we see souls saved, Father? We pray that in our local community you would use us. We pray that this would reach past our community and that your gospel would continue to convert the hearts of men. To you be all glory and honor through Jesus Christ, our sovereign King. Amen. Thank you all again for coming.